use of many objects in the place of women, such as sex robots. So I'm going to talk about sexology, the, the, the science of sexuality. I can't see if that screen is up. Is that screen up, uh, Kathleen? Uh, no, I've taken it down. Do you want me to okay. put it back up? Um, no, uh, that's okay. That's okay. 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 Now, the, the, um, the photo that was up was of vajankles. Vajankles are a lifelike lycra models of women's feet and ankles with a vulva. Uh, it can sometimes be underneath the foot, but most likely it's going to be in the ankle itself. Um, and as most of you here probably know, there is a huge industry of creating lycra body parts of women, some of them for men to put on themselves, some of them to use um, to put their penises into, and so on. Uh, it is a particularly macabre image because it does look as if the ankles of women have been cut off. And of course, that does some, sometimes happen. In my book, Beauty and Misogyny, I, I mention a a Chinese emperor who cut the feet of thousands of women and just threw the women onto a pile with, without their feet. So that there is a connection between this dismemberment of women and what's actually done to women. So uh, I'm going to start off by uh, talking about male sexuality. Before we begin at all, though, I think we, I need to say that the sexologists, the scientists of sex, point out that women don't have fetishes. Uh, it's simply not something women do for sexual excitement, although it's enormously common, as we shall see amongst men. For instance, teenage girls do not steal boys' underwear from clotheslines in order to take home and masturbate in. And of course, boys do do that. It's quite common. Uh, that practice is called snow dropping. And often it's a precursor to uh, forms of transvestism. So... What, we need to understand male sexuality because we have to change it. And changing male sexuality is not a matter of abstract interest for women because the way in which male sexuality is constructed dramatically affects our lives. Uh, it serves both to create and maintain our oppression. The exercise of the male sex right, men's right of sexual access to the bodies of women and children, has led to the creation of massive industries of pain in which women and children are warehoused for men's delight in prostitution and pornography. It means that the male sex right means that men feel entitled to demand women's sexual attention or touch women or use women's bodies in public space in the form of sexual harassment and rape. It means that states and cultures organize and donate the bodies of women and girls to men for their exclusive use through marriage in all of its forms, temporary marriage, arranged marriage, forced marriage, love marriages, polygamy, and so on. In these arrangements of ownership, men have absolute right to use women at will, even if there are, as in some jurisdictions at this time, laws against marital rape, for instance. But these laws are almost never used. Men's ownership is still, even in uh, countries like the UK, effectively untrammeled in their um, rights of use in marriage and relationships. The expression of male sexuality has, is extremely problematic for women because it sets up siege conditions for women and girls. Women and girls have to manage their roots out of home, the way they exist in a school or in a workplace, in order to avoid sexual assault or exploitation. And the best example of this is the spy cam emergency in Korea. In Korea, men armed with excellent technology are using spy cams and mobile phones to lay siege to women. Men use mobile phones to photograph women, uh, to photograph up women's clothing as they walk along the street and through and over toilet walls, which are pockmarked with holes to enable the men access. The film is streamed straight onto the internet, often for profit. Criminal gangs stake out toilets and love hotels to film women in sexual activity. And they make a lot of money from streaming this. So serious is the situation. The specialist firms have been set up which are paid to sweep premises such as conference centers to get rid of the spy cams until, of course, the perpetrators can re-establish them. 
the perpetrators explain that their excitement comes from stealing the photos of the women without their knowledge. The effect is that women are const continually observed and striving to prevent themselves from being observed, and the even using toilets is dangerous. The spy cam situation demonstrates the extent to which every advance in technology can be and is used to advance men's sexual violation of women and the destruction of our freedom. The transformation of men's sexuality is of vital, even life and death importance to us as women and as feminists. It's important that we do not leave consideration of male sexuality to those who set themselves up as the experts, the sexologists, other men who find men's sexual interests fascinating and harmless. So now I'm going to talk about how sexuality is constructed. The sexologists, the scientists of sex, see sexuality as largely innate. And they do a great deal of research to show that homosexuality is innate, uh, that child sexual abuse is innate, even nappy fetishism is innate. Feminists see sex, male sexuality as socially constructed. We don't have a choice because we have to change it. We have to assert that men's sexual behavior is a matter of choices they make, that they have responsibility for and must change. Saying that sexuality is socially constructed means that the capacity for sexual pleasure is biological, but the way in which people become, behave sexually and the persons they choose to be sexual with, these things are shaped by culture and experience. My favorite example to show the social construction of sexuality is a, is a sexological case from the 1950s, in fact, in which a couple went to the doctor to find out why the wife could not get pregnant. The doctor found that the husband had been trying to penetrate his wife through her belly button. It was probably not much fun for the wife, um, particularly, and, and it was not effective in creating pregnancy. This was the 1950s. The pornography industry, which is now the main sex instruction tool of the society, so the main force in the construction of sexuality at an everyday level, that didn't exist at that time. There were magazines, but there were no videos showing what could be done to penetrate women. Now, the main power involved in shaping the expression of sexuality is the power relationship of male domination and women's subordination. Sex is not a neutral form of behavior, such as whether you use a fork to eat or not. It is the mechanism through which the power relations between the sexes are established and symbolically and actually acted out. Women learn to eroticize their own subordination and men learn to eroticize their dominance. Boys and men learn to feel sexual and learn emotion in power positions of power as members of the dominant sex class. They learn sex as power over women. Women, on the other hand, learn to feel sexual in a condition of powerlessness. Women do not have power to eroticize. I can remember as a child of about eight, being constantly chased by boys on the beach in Malta, where I lived. They would squirt me with juice and pips of a beach plant for their fun. And of course, we all have many more examples of the way boys and girls learn their positions in the hierarchy and what it feels like to act them out. So the boys learn to be sexual in the context of behaving like that, and girls learn to be sexual in the context of receiving that behavior. A particular problem for boys and men as they learn to be sexual is that they have to work out how to relate in a way which may make them vulnerable and involve intimacy, because that is what sexual activity is, with a member of a group of people, women, that they consider inferior and are trained, as boys now are, to find disgusting. This is a problem which is never mentioned, but there are many, many fetishes concerned with disgust and disgust at women. Now, I'm going to say something about sexology, which is the sort of the force that adjudicates sexuality in Western culture. The main enforcers in the construction of sexuality in the last two centuries 
uh, has, been, has been in the form of sexology, the science of sex, sexology and sex therapy, which is its child, adjudicate on what's acceptable sexually, but they also promote the male sex right and enforce women's obeisance to men's demands. Before the late 19th century in the West, the church was in charge of sex. Miscreants were brought before the church courts for engaging in a prohibited activity such as anal sex. The church said what people were to, to do and with whom. By the second half of the century, the church had lost its power to control the people, particularly working class people in the towns, who were often unable to say who Jesus was when worried missionaries went out into the industrial cities to interrogate them. Power to adjudicate over sex had to move to another authority, and this was sexology. In the late 19th century, medical scientists took control of sex. They classified what the correct practice was, penis and vagina sex. But in the first part of the 20th century, an extra component was added. Uh, the, the women were to be enthusiastic in sexual relations about being penetrated. And the doctors decided in the 1920s, for instance, that between 40 and 100% of women were in fact frigid because they were not enthusiastic about penis and vagina sex. The main job for the sexologists then was making sure women got penetrated and at least pretended to enjoy it. I've written about all of this in my books, my first two books, and it shows quite clearly how what was to be done sexually by women was being constructed. The other main task of the sexologists was to make lists of the practices which were not normal, what they saw as the perversions or paraphilias. They collected these more unusual behaviors from their male patients and gave them names. Richard Kraft Ebbing described what he considered to be the perversions in his book, Psychopathia Sexualis, in 1887. The perversions were described in Latin so that only doctors could read about them. The names that Kraft Ebbing and other sexologists such as Henry Havelock Ellis and Sigmund Freud invented for the perversions were generally mixtures of Latin and Greek. My favorite is capillary kleptomania, which means hair stealing. Men in the early 20th century would sit next to a girl on the tram and cut off her plait, taking it away to masturbate into. Men's sexual fetishizing of women's hair is the reason so many if not the vast majority of one, young women today have long hair, despite how inconvenient and difficult it is. There was a very wide range of perversions recorded in sexological work in the early decades of the 20th century. Men who liked women to be dirty were named celeromaniacs. One version of this is paying women to mud wrestle. The perversions included Rennie Fleurism, in which men would gain satisfaction from smells, particularly the smell of urine. In urolagnia, men get excitement from watching women urinate. There were gay forms of urolagnia too. In one case, in the medical literature, a man would go into the men's toilets and get other men to urinate into his coat pockets. In coprophilia, men were excited by shit, and in coprophagia, men uh, liked to eat women's shit by visiting prostituted women and eating their shit off teaspoons. There are media reports of, of men doing all of these things today. Usually women and girls are the objects of these practices and experience distress, if not more serious forms of harm. Women do not have perversions, according to the sexologists, although they don't explain why. When it came to explanation, the sexologists very often said, that the men's behavior was the result of the way that their mothers had behaved wrongly towards them. They never mentioned the power relations between men and women, which caused the sexual behavior of the ruling class to be so distorted. Now I want to talk about fetishism in more detail. The sexologists did not dis just describe the perversions, but they sought to explain them. Fetishism consists of the adoption by a man of an inanimate object as the center of his sexual excitement. This substitute um, for a woman or was called a fetish after the practice in many religions of creating objects 
which they endow with sacred significance. This happens, for instance, in the Catholic Church, in the wine and bread in communion, which become the bloody and Christ, uh, body of Christ. That's um, fetishism. The basic explanation that the sexologists suggested was that perversions occurred if the natural flow of the libido or sexual urge was blocked by some event in childhood. They believed there was such a thing as a natural, uh, natural uh, sexual urge. Freud and the other sexologists based their ideas about sex on a hydraulic model in which the libido surged up like the magma in a volcano, excuse the imagery, until it burst forth. According to Freud, fetishism resulted from boys' childhood experience of the castration complex. The castration complex was a story he invented centered on the godlike significance of the penis. He decided that when boys first saw their mothers naked, probably no boys normally would do that at all, but he imagined that they did, uh, they felt terrible fear that their penis would be confiscated, as he put it. Probably no human male is spared the fright of castration at the sight of a female genital. He said, I cannot imagine that many men in the Victorian England, boys in the Victorian England in which he was brought up, were seeing their mothers naked. In most houses, there were not even bathrooms or anywhere to wash. As a result of the terror the boy feels, he had to invent a substitute for the penis uh, that his mother did not have to sort of make up for the fact that it wasn't there. And he says, it remains a token of triumph over the threat of castration and a protection against it. And the fetish uh, would usually be in some way connected with a woman's body and may consist of shoes, underwear, or her hair. Uh, women didn't do not, the sexologists tell us, do fetishism. And Freud would doubtless say that this is because women do not suffer the first the castration complex. The sexologists did not necessarily see fetishism as a problem. On the contrary, uh, Henry Havelock Ellis devoted an entire volume of his studies in the psychology of sex to fetishism under the title Erotic Symbolism. He said that erotic symbolists or fetishists were superior to men who were not. Their ability to create an imaginative sexual life showed that they were intellectuals, and he meant himself, of course. He was a urolagnist. He was excited by urination, specifically women's urination. He used to get significant feminist acquaintances such as feminist um, birth control campaigners, to urinate so that he could see and hear. He would get them to go into a room in his house and urinate with the door open so that he could listen, or to walk in front of him on the pavement on the way into Harrods whilst urinating onto the ground along the way. Women, I guess, who do not have fetishes uh, may just be boring and non-intellectual. Now, the fetishes that the sexologists talked about at, it, at this time, I argue, became liberated and they gained rights and uh, uh, all kinds of opportunities in the second half of the 20th century. Until the 1960s, the sexologists still usually wrote about sexual perversions or paraphilias as mental health problems that required treatment. This changed in the late 20th century when many of these perversions were liberated and normalized. And two things caused this to happen. The so-called sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s ushered in a wave of sexual liberalism, which mainly consisted of ensuring men greater sexual access to girls and women and getting women to service their needs. Uh, the sexual revolution instructed women that they must do more than just tolerate being penetrated and pretend to be enthusiastic about it. The sexologists had required that for some time. Now they must accept uh, in Alex Comfort's Joy of Sex, for instance, all sorts of other practices, such as sadomasochistic practices, being gagged, and they must accept buttered bun. That's a practice in which many men ejaculated into one woman's vagina one after another. That was in this famous 1973 book, The Joy of Sex, as a perfectly ordinary thing that women should be expected to do. Otherwise, apparently, they had inhibitions. The sexual revolution created the basis in sexual liberalism for the development of the pornography industry and also enabled groups of men to get together to support each other and campaign for their sexual liberation. As the new porn industry developed, it grew to service all the forms of fetishism that the sexologists had documented. When pornography moved onto the internet in the 1990s, 
the industry supercharged all the paraphilias and fetishes such as transvestism and sadomasochism. Around the sex industry and the new online pornography industry, interest and support groups were set up by men to service their fetishes. These groupings were called communities. One early community, for instance, was formed around the tattooing of women. In the 1980s, men serviced their interest in tattooing women with magazines with photographs of naked women tattooed from head to toe, and they staged conventions at which they could observe these wonders. In the 1980s, when I was in Los Angeles, I picked up a copy of Piercing Fans International Quarterly, which contained the story of an um, American man who had his wife covered in tattoos. When she died, he realized he had a valuable commodity, skinned her, and sold the skin to the highest bidder. Now, I think that's a particularly useful example of fetishism. The skin was certainly worth more than the woman. And if anybody wonders why so many women have tattoos now, that is, of course, because uh, said a masochism and the practice of tattooing that was part of it came to dominate the culture and men want women to be tattooed. Now, the sexual revolution launched the gay liberation movement, uh, but gay uh, homosexuality, of course, though it was regarded as a perversion in the early years of sexology, uh, it resembles none of the other practices we're talking about here in any way. It does not harm anybody and is a practice, of course, between two adults. And it's, it's, um, it doesn't have victims. The perversions are forms of male sexual behavior which do have victims and have harmful effects on women's lives. Many, many, many harmful effects, and I cannot go into all of those today. The newly liberated liberation movements by paedophiles and transvestites, however, use the model of homosexual liberation as a basis for their demands for sexual access to children and to imitate women in public. The paedophile liberation movement got underway in the UK, the US, France, Germany, and the Netherlands in the 1970s. And the paedophile activists demanded access to children through the removal of age of consent laws. They argued that men who are fixated on the sexual abuse of children should be seen as a special kind of person whose sexual interest was innate and could not be changed. They had, they said, a sexual orientation just like gay men. Indeed, the great majority of those who led the paedophile movement were gay men and saw their struggles as totally integrated. Today, this movement is alive and well with an academic industry of apologists publishing research on how paedophiles must be accepted because if they suffer from stigma, they will be deterred from getting treatment and will abuse children. To prevent sexual abuse of children, we are told we must love the abusers. The sexologists are involved in the norm normalizing of paedophilia very much at the moment. Transvestites strode out of the sexologist textbooks and onto the streets from the 1970s onwards. In the early part of the 20th century, the sex scientists said that these men simply had the sexual fetish of transvestism or cross-dressing. They did not suggest they could change sex. Nowadays, of course, the many transvestites call themselves um, transgender and demand the rights to gender identity. Um, in order to be able to express their sexual interests. I want to say something about nappy fetishism because this is something I have been uh, reading about recently. Um, the sexologists tend to develop euphemistic and new normalizing names for men's fetish behavior. One of these that provides a good example of how men's fetishism is being normalized and how it affects women is what I call nappy fetishism and the sexologists call paraphilic infantilism, or adult baby syndrome, or age identity disorder. The men who practice this um, sexual uh, uh, behavior call themselves at the adult baby diaper lover community. They are always communities. And there are many thousands of these men online. The online practitioners are matched with sexologists who study them, and the sexologists mainly find them in the online groups thousands at a time. Apparently only a minority believe that they really are babies, though 10% 10, uh, 10 want to be babies all their lives. For the wives, this fetish behavior is psychologically torturing. And I found an interesting academic article in um, a therapy journal, a sex therapy journal, talking about a couple who were brought, uh, a man brought his wife to couples therapy because he wanted to, to accept his behavior. 
When Mr. A's diaper wearing behavior was discovered by his wife, four years prior to entering couples therapy, he initially expressed remorse and a desire to change. However, after repeated unsuccessful attempts to stop, he turned to an internet-based community of diaper lovers where he found acceptance and in time, he desired the same from his wife. Emboldened by his new perspective, he began pressuring his wife to also wear diapers, change his soiled diapers and incorporate diaper wearing into their sex life. Unable to effectively manage these and other family related stressors, Mr. A's wife resorted to self-harm behavior and restricting her food intake, which in turn led to serial hospitalizations and ultimately a referral for couples therapy. Now this is, it's very similar to the trajectory that's now happening with all of these perversions like transvestism, it's precisely similar. The men join online communities, they decide with all of these other men that it's completely reasonable so they can go home and they can pressure their wives to be involved in these fetishistic activities and it causes the wives enormous distress. Uh, the the wives are enormously distressed by the operation of all of these uh, perversions in various different ways and I won't, I don't have time to go to, into them in great detail. I want to say something now about the fetish industry. Large industries have been built up to service the fetishes which are being disseminated and developed through pornography. There are universes of commerce online where the fetish objects are available to the practitioners nappy fetishism and trans transvestors frequently manifest together. Uh, the men tend to imagine themselves as girl babies and the rubber baby pants, reins and bibs on the many nappy fetishist websites are always pink. Um, all of the men's se uh, uh, sexual uh, paraphilias are immensely profitable. Probably transvestism is the most profitable because there are more, more, most things that can be sold. But for sadomasochists, of course, there are many, many objects as well. Child sex abusers too provide a market for fetish objects. Those who call themselves pedophiles in the present um, say that they are special. They're not ordinary child sex abusers because they have an orientation. They cannot help but be interested in children. They're special because they're non-contact. They don't really touch the children. Uh, the website Virtuous Pedophiles, for instance, which has thousands of members, say that it represents only men who are non-contact, i.e. virtuous. Um, and they say um, probably the men shouldn't use child pornography because it's mostly illegal. So they could get into trouble for that, they say on the website. Uh, but they should be able to use child sex dolls because they are not illegal. Um, this, of course, is not a way to stop themselves acting out. The more the men are using pornography and all of these objects in order to build their fantasies and reinforce their fantasies, um, the more likely it is that they will never be able to stop. They could stop, of course, and they could just stop you having those fantasies. There are ways of changing what happens in your head. Um, the, uh, the, the, there's an interesting website called Prost Asia, which is supposedly about stopping male sex tourists from Europe using children in prostitution in Asia. It's a human rights organization. It has you know, a huge amount of funding from all sorts of reputable agencies. On the Prostasia website, there is a little a, a chat um, room where men are talking about child sex dolls. They're purveyors of child sex dolls, selling the dolls into there, and there are the men who like them. They talk about how we need to change the names, the name intimate companion, is better than child sex doll because it doesn't sound as bad. Um, and um, they, the one of the purveyors of the child sex doll says, um, call them realistic companion dolls. Your customers do not need to be told what they can do with it. Sell the genitalia separately, ship under different cover, especially with the immature type. So there's a, 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 an important fetish industry being built up there for child sex abusers. Now, what is to be done about all of this? The liberation of women is not possible, whilst it is precisely women's subordination that is the template of sexuality. Male sexuality has to change. It's feminists who fought to place limits on men's demands for the male sex right to be extended. 
Um, I was involved in the 1970s in fighting to keep the age of consent and prevent um, gay uh, paedophile organisations from getting it removed. Um, it, it, I know we're going to talk a lot today about ways forward, but one particularly good example of ways in which feminists are, are fighting to stop these men right now is in Korea, the massive demonstrations that have taken place there against spy cam. Korean feminists are a, a model for us all in what can be done, how we can actually work to change, to say no to men, to say to men, you have to change yourselves, you have to recognize your choices, you have to change the fantasies inside your head. Men have to change. I'll leave it there for now, thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Virtual clap. I'm sure everyone's, uh, that was just amazing. Absolutely brilliant. Um, it would be great to work together on something around this because what's really interesting about this issue is it's not presented as a fetish. In fact, um, I'm going to talk a bit about this later. Even before we even got to the point of the sex robots, people in robotics labs at respectable universities like MIT, and Waseda began talking about robots as companions to people. They could help the elderly, you know, they could help people with social communication disorders, with autism. And basically, um, the, sex, the sex doll and sex robot industry, and let me say, the sex robot industry is Siri in a head. Um, so don't think it's like ex machina out there, because it's certainly not. But uh, they have been trading on these ideas that developed inside labs. Um, so it's really interesting that you're actually locating exactly what this whole cultural problem is, which is the fetish. And we need to, I think we need to restore that message in our understanding of what's going on in, in sex robot culture and the deeper meanings of fetish, fetishic culture. So would you like to respond to that before we go to questions? Sorry, I, did, I didn't completely understand. What do you want me to, uh, to answer? Sorry. Well, the, the framework of the fetish is not yes. the framework in which this problem no. of the rise of sex yes. doll. Yes, I see and you've, what you actually, mean. you've actually brought it back to that issue. And I think that's what's really unique about your perspective. Um, but how do you think they've managed to have this conversation about normalizing sex dolls? Because you can go into brothels now. We'll talk about there's child abuse sex dolls you can buy. Uh, there's pornography with dolls in. Um, women are being pressured, I would say. Women are being encouraged now to take their partner and participate in sex with dolls as well. So it's already going on exactly yes. what... Yes, it's already going on. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh, I think it's interesting that... The, uh, that the dolls have not been seen as fetishes because obviously they're fetish objects. And when you look at the vajankal, for instance, that I, that I showed a picture of earlier and all the other kinds of uh, lycra body parts, they are all very clearly fetish objects. There's no question about that. Um, how has, uh, is that, why is that not part of the discussion? I think because the discussion is not being led by feminists, by those of us who are critical of what's going on. Um, I'm not, I think absolutely women are being forced, cajoled by sex therapy um, and in by advice magazines or loads of, them, of magazines now of course have got articles on kink telling women that they must accept various of these practices um, and even in the 1970s it was beginning to happen. So yes, um, women's lives are being hugely affected and there is no way that they would not be. Uh, for the most part, men don't seem to want to go off and hide behind a bush and use um, their fetish. Women are being affected all along the line. 